I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. The Red Army Choir singing the Red Cavalry. This underlines the Russian Spring. That's what it's called in Moscow now. Vladimir Putin is enjoying the highest approval rating in memory, pushing 80%. I'm told that there are volunteers to the Russian military, not seen perhaps since the first war. I'm told that a MIG, at a MIG factory over these last days, the workers stayed extra, worked overtime to deliver MIG-29s to the Russian Air Force. I'm told that there is a spirit of patriotism running throughout Rodina, throughout the motherland, throughout Russia. And why? The events of these last hours point to anything but exuberance. They point to anxiety and worse in Europe, in the United States, around the world. Within these last hours, and I'm following the reporting from AFP, thanks to the blog at the London Telegraph, I recommend to everyone, there's also a blog being run at uh, 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 Russia Today, but I'll follow the Telegraph. Vladimir Putin and, and Chancellor Merkel uh, spent time on the phone discussing what Putin, Mr. Putin, the president of Russia says is a crisis. The quote here from the Kremlin, the Russian president remarked that the sharp escalation of the conflict has placed the country in effect on the verge of civil war. Those are very strong words. It points to the events earlier today, gunfire and aggression by Ukrainian forces in eastern Ukraine called Novorossiya in Russia near a town called Slavyansk. It's part of an oblast that includes Donetsk. This is the large industrial and extremely prosperous part of Ukraine. Much Russian speaking. There's been turmoil the last week. There are occupied buildings in the oblast of Donetsk, the municipal buildings, and many of the smaller towns. I'm joined now by Professor Steve Cohen of NYU and Princeton University. Over these last months, Steve has pointed to this conflict as a trigger for much worse. And we see tonight, with Vladimir Putin's words to Chancellor Merkel, that the threat of civil war now threatens all of Europe and the United States. Steve, a very good evening to you. Mr. Putin and Mr. and Ms. Merkel, I'm told, speak in Russian because... Though Mr. Putin has the German, Ms. Merkel, who learned Russian as a younger person in East Germany, believes that she speaks in deference and diplomatic niceties to the president of Russia. It also indicates, of course, that Russia has the high hand here. When Mr. Putin says civil war, is that the worst case scenario that you've been speaking of for many weeks, Steve? Civil war in Ukraine. Good evening to you. No, the worst case scenario, John, is war between the United States and Russia, or the United States, NATO on one side, and Russia on the other. That's the worst scenario about which I've been speaking for, I guess, since November. But uh, if there's a civil war in Ukraine, and in a way there already is a civil war in Ukraine, though it's a localized and low-key one at the moment, but could grow much larger, If there's a civil war in Ukraine, it's hard to imagine a civil war in Ukraine without the United States and NATO intervening on one side, Russia on the other, and that would bring us very quickly to the worst case scenario. I formulated it, John, when we began uh, talking about this subject. I said we were three steps from war between America and Russia. The first two steps being that NATO troops would move into western Ukraine, Russian troops into eastern Ukraine. A civil war would bring that about. So it's, it's, it's not hyperbole. And it wasn't only Putin. In fact, the first person in Russia was his prime minister, Medvedev, the former president of Russia, who at a press conference earlier today said that we are in or on the verge of civil war in Ukraine, and then Putin repeated it to Merkel. And Merkel knows, no matter what her public policy is, uh, she knows very well, because she grew up in that part of the world, she knows what's going on in Ukraine. And I'm sure about civil war, she did not disagree with Putin. I want to go to other voices in these last hours, because all of this is in the mix tonight. Europe, it's dark, and it's coming morning in Russia and Ukraine now, but all of Europe is watching this as the capitals light up. For example, earlier today, Mr. Putin was on the phone with Ban Ki-moon, the General Secretary of the United Nations, saying that he wants a condemnation of the United Nations Security Council towards whoever it is that ordered the aggression by the Kiev forces at Slavyansk, gunfire and threats to citizens. Also today, the Polish foreign minister, 
Uh, Mr. Sikorsky said that Warsaw now agrees fully with a military operation in eastern Ukraine. He, uh, this is supporting the Ukraine, the Ukrainian offensive. Mr. Sikorsky's voice is significant, Steve. You've guided me to watch this very carefully because Poland bordering western Ukraine is one of the adversaries to Moscow in this debate, a, a very strong voice at NATO, the 28 nations of NATO. And Poland has a first-rate military. They could take the field here if it comes to a civil war. I also point to the voices at the White House. Earlier today, Mr. Carney, speaking for the president, said that the president very much supported the Kiev government in suppressing what looks to be bandits, sometimes called uh, these separatists who are also seen as terrorists in eastern Ukraine. All of these voices point to the fact, Steve, that this is not a local matter. This is already at the global level. Have I said all that correctly, Steve? You have, and the fact that it's a, an international, not a, not a local issue anymore, is the way it's playing out in the media. Note that uh, people say that in eastern Ukraine, where pro-Russian Ukrainians, that's what they are. It doesn't mean they want to join Russia, by the way. The great majority of them, probably 90%, do not want to join Russia. They're protesting in favor of more autonomy in Ukraine. They think they've gotten a very raw deal from the government of Kiev. But notice that they aren't imitating what happened in Crimea. That's what the media story is. And therefore, this is about annexation. Uh, they're imitating what happened in Kiev in November when the protesters, the pro-Western protesters in Kiev began occupying government buildings, uh, burning uh, uh, the rubber tires of automobiles and trucks to defend themselves, and making Molotov cocktails. It's a pure imitation of what happened in Kiev. Now remember, when that was unfolding, the Western media, particularly the American media, called these people pro-democracy protesters. And now when it's going on in eastern Ukraine, they're anti-democratic mobs, and the, the Kiev government, which is unwise in the extreme, but we've embraced it, refers to them as terrorists. Right. Now, once you evoke the word terrorist, yeah, terrorist, you're evoking a whole new response. Obviously, we're all against terrorists. We've got to stamp these people out. But why, in, under any scenario, would you refer to people who have occupied buildings uh, as terrorists? You wouldn't do it in any other context, but because they're pro-Russian, they're now terrorists. So you've got this, this drumbeat of war. I watched, I don't know if this is legitimate to report this, John, but <clears throat> when I was waiting for you to call me, I watched three uh, alleged news networks tonight uh, on the Ukrainian story, Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, and the editorial edge was exactly the same, that Russia's invading Ukraine, that all of this is illegitimate, that Russia has no legitimate grievance in this, it's all unprovoked, and we begin to hear the analogy that teaches the lesson that's inescapable, that this is Hitler on the move, this is Munich, there can be no appeasement, and if there's no appeasement or negotiations, then you're back at war again. So I worry very much that we're in the run-up to actual war, not just Cold War, and how big it will get is really the second question. I want to go to Vladimir Putin when we come back, Steve, because the reporting is that Mr. Putin is very concerned with the threats to the Russian speakers, not Russian citizens, but the Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. And I believe that's why he sees the verge of civil war. The president of Russia is under pressure from Russian people to do something to save these people being threatened by Ukrainians. Now, can he? Will he? I do not know. Steve Cohen professor of Russian history at NYU and at Princeton University Emeritus. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. Steve Cohen of New York University is here with me, and we're discussing Ukraine crisis now from Vladimir Putin's point of view. The president of Russia 
I'm told Russian media is making it very clear to the Russian people and they are incensed at the threats to Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine. Steve, in your article, Cold War Again, Who's Responsible? You've identified the immediate future that would settle this for Vladimir Putin and the Ukrainians. It would look very much like a confederation, that is, individual parts of, East, of Ukraine, eastern, western, Crimea, all those having governances that were not independent, but then again are not directed by Kiev, and turn Ukraine into something like a neutral state, not unlike Finland during the Cold War. Is that satisfactory to Putin, in your opinion? Yeah, I think you've, uh, we need a refinement. Uh, from what you said, but let me just refer back to my article, uh, which was published last week in The Nation and is at thenation.com. I had in front of me when I wrote the article the negotiating points that the Russian foreign ministry had issued almost a month ago on March 17th that were largely ignored in the West, but now have been taken up as a possible agenda if they sit down in Geneva the day after tomorrow on Thursday. It's a big if. Now, the Russian bottom line for a negotiated settlement, and mind you, depending on your perspective, a negotiated settlement is either more likely or less likely because of the military operations taking place in Ukraine at the moment. But here's the bottom Russian line. An end of NATO exp expansion to any and all remaining former republics of the Soviet Union primarily Ukraine, but also the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. That is the bottom line. The Russians will not sign off on anything else, because for Russia, this whole crisis in Ukraine, beginning in November, was about bringing Ukraine into NATO. The Russians want that off the table forever. Secondly, they do want a stable Ukraine, because it's a neighboring country, but also because the Russian economy like the Ukrainian economy, is heavily dependent on Russian-Ukrainian trade. Heavily, heavily, heavily dependent. In order to stabilize Ukraine, according to the Russians, and they're not alone, and here's where we have to revise what you said a bit, Russia is calling for a new Ukrainian constitution that would be a federal constitution. And they point to the United States. The central government would have powers, the states called regions or oblasty and Ukraine would have powers. And the problem is, is that the Russian proposal sounds too much like what you just called it, a confederation, not a federation. Because in a confederation, the central government has almost no power. It's not even clear who, get, who collects taxes, who recruits the army. So confederation would result in a very unstable Ukraine. And the critics of this idea are right in saying that it would leave Ukraine at the mercy of both Russia and Europe. Each would take its chunk. But a real federation where the central government in Kiev had substantial power, but the components of Ukraine, which are fundamentally different politically, we've talked about this, ethnically, linguistically, culturally, would have lo more local autonomy. For example... Under the current constitution, all the governors of the regions of Ukraine are not elected. I repeat, they are not elected. They are appointed by the government, the president, or the parliament in Kiev. Eastern Ukraine doesn't want this outcome. It wants to elect its own governors. So does Western Ukraine, for that matter. So that is a reasonable discussion. It's not confederation. The Russians are asking for too much local autonomy. For example, in the Russian proposal, there's even a line that the regions could decide with whom they wanted to have foreign relations. You can't take that away from the federal government. You wouldn't have a unitary state of any kind. But there's a lot of bargaining room there. So I think that is, along with non-alignment, along with continuing economic relations with Russia, Putin's three bottom lines. And I see no reason in the world why, why variations on that do not constitute a reasonable alternative to war. None whatsoever. Now, before I stop on this point, John, imagine what the alternatives are as we talk tonight. One is a negotiated, federated Ukraine, where all three parties are reasonably satisfied, East, West, and Ukraine. 
The second is civil war. Right. The third is war between Russia and the United States. And the fourth is a partitioned Ukraine, a very real possibility, where it turns out that Ukraine cannot be held together and will have to become two states, east and west. The problem with that is, what do you do about central Ukraine, which religiously, ethically, linguistically, is such a mix that nobody would know where to draw the line. But there are these real possibilities, not theoretical, but rooted in existing circumstances today, and that's what's at stake as we discuss the issue and as the story goes forward. Alexander Turchinov, who is the interim president yeah. of Kiev, of Ukraine, yeah. has made his choice, Steve. It's not a potential for him. It's a fact. He's launched armed men to attack people who are called citizens who are protesting that they have a right to uh, conduct their own affairs. Uh, the uh, People's Republic of Donetsk, I watched a video over the weekend. It looked like a reproduction of the Smolny Institute. They did their history very well once upon a time. Now, in Russia, right now, on the television, all night, you watch this, Steve, you can understand the Russian. I have to read it in translation. The, 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 uh, uh, the presentation is that fascists and extremists are attacking uh, honest working people who only want the best for their families. And there are photographs everywhere of armored personnel carriers with flags waving and heavily armed men rolling towards Slavyansk. Now, Steve, it's too late for negotiation. This is an, this, this it looks like hysteria and reaction right now on the ground. And therefore, this idea that they can pull back to a federation, I think it's broken. I think that the, the, the I, blood I is in the water. I can't. Maybe I'm just a more optimistic personality, but I can't go there to say there's no longer space for negotiation. There's no longer, because this is what you're saying, I think, there's no longer the possibility of keeping Ukraine together. Not so, for a central state. For a confederacy, yes, but, but not a, for a central well, state. I don't know that we want to debate this, but I think a confederacy would also be the end of Ukraine. The countries... Look, let's just back up one minute. The Whenever... What, what we have here are two different stories. The story Moscow is telling, you right. just told it, and the story Washington. Forget Europe now, because Europe's divided about by all this, but Washington is speaking in one voice. Just 30 seconds, and we'll come back after the break. McCain, Obama, Kerry, everybody opens their mouth in Washington is saying that all the unrest in Ukraine is caused by Putin. That's what they're saying. Right. That, that obscures, it tells a lie about the fundamental reality that's caused the problems, that Ukraine is a profoundly divided country. That's the reality. But to say Putin's created all the conflicts is to obscure everything we have to deal with. And that's why, though the Russian story isn't too accurate either, the American story is simply detached from reality. Professor, Professor Steve Cohen of New York University in Russian History at Princeton University. And when we come back, who's launched the tanks? Turchinev's launched the tanks. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. I'm going to review the events of these last hours in Ukraine because this story is spilling out in European time ahead of the American clock. And it is difficult to catch up because by the time our evening and for, uh, for news review, the Russians, uh, Ukrainians, uh, British have either gone to bed or stopped recording. And they're keeping a blog at the London Telegraph. They're keeping a blog at uh, Russia Today, too. So it's helpful to follow through with this. Earlier today, what we heard from Moscow and also from Kiev is that uh, forces, uh, are, including armored personnel carriers, heavily ga uh, uh, armed Ukrainian forces, sometimes were referred to as special police, sometimes they just looked like ground forces, were launched against an eastern Ukrainian city called Slovyansk. Slovyansk is in the Donetsk Oblast. This is a four and a half million people, a very large area of Ukraine. 
This, uh, uh, this launch was said to be centered at an air base called Kramatorsk. This is in eastern Ukraine. There were high-performance aircraft visible as well as uh, Ukrainian helicopters overhead. There are photographs everywhere. You can see them. This was meant to be of an overwhelming force. The um, Ukrainian uh, uh, Kiev spokesperson said that there were armed people who had occupied this airport, and therefore the response from Kiev was to launch an offensive against them. Now, uh, according to reporting, and you have to be very careful here, you get the sources you can, uh, residents of the eastern Ukrainian city of Lukansk stopped a convoy of armored vehicles of the Ukrainian army approaching their city. Six APC trucks with howitzers were heading to Fort Lugansk. This is also in, I believe, the Oblast. That's the province these, of um, the large city of, is called Donetsk. Uh, this, air, this report is, in, is informal, but it's, it's helpful to understand that what we're viewing here is an ongoing scattering of reporting. The Russian media is reporting all of this as an offense launched against unarmed or civilian personnel, people who don't know why this is happening. Now, at the same time this is all going on, we hear that there are to be four-party talks. That's the U.S., the EU, Russia, and Ukraine's a permanent representative at the U.N. Uh, this is according to Ukraine's permanent representative at the U.N., we don't know who is going to represent Ukraine at this. It's possible that it will be just the foreign minister out of Kiev. Russia has requested that the, four, that the uh, cities in eastern Ukraine who are declaring their independence also send representatives to these talks. This is scheduled for Thursday the 17th. We don't know who will be there. Uh, Professor Steve Cohen indicates that possibly Lavrov, the foreign minister, will not attend unless there are all these Ukrainian representatives from eastern Ukraine. Now, while this is going on during the day, these uh, 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 point and counterpoint about who will negotiate later on in the week, where the troops are, who's under fire, where fire is, where gunfire has been held, we learn from we we then move immediately to the White House, where White House. Uh, the sp uh, speaker at the White House, Mr. Carney, praised the Kiev government for enforcing its law in eastern Ukraine. The statement from Mr. Carney was, the Ukrainian government has the responsibility to provide law and order, and these provocations in eastern Ukraine are creating a situation in which the government has to respond. This very much, and Mr. Carney went on to say, and I'm quoting from Reuters, uh, the, we are looking forward uh, to this meeting on Thursday to see whether or not there is, the potential anyway, for moving forward on diplomatic resolutions. That's Mr. Carney at the White House. At this point, lots of local residents supporting the separatists were gathering out near or heading to the air base, this one that is said to be liberated by Ukrainian troops. This is according to a reporting out of Moscow, RIA Novosti. Uh, this air base is called Kramatorsk. There's a photograph at day's end of civilians walking towards the air base. It's very strange. It's at sunset in Donetsk, uh, reporting out of the air base. Hundreds of people in the countryside. I don't know how they got there. I guess they just walked in the area. They come up against armed Ukrainian soldiers. The, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian soldiers are pointing their rifles at these pro-Russian protesters. This is in the Ukrainian countryside. This is all happening with uh, photographers all around. I'm looking at Reuters photographers right now. These events are scattered throughout this vast region of eastern Ukraine. You can understand. And then later on tonight, the Guardian in the same evening, the Guardian has a photograph up. It's extremely controversial given what I'm witnessing. It's said to be Ukrainian forces storming a police station in Kramatorsk where these people are walking. In fact, it shows at the steps of this police station men with weapons raised. It almost looks like a pantomime as if they're posing, but one weapon looks like it's being fired. As the photographer, this is an ITAR TASS photography. Again, you have to be careful because ITAR TASS is Moscow. Reuters 
is neutral, but Reuters hires people who are local. This looks like Ukrainian forces are attacking a police station in Kramatorsk. Now, that all describes what looks very much like a, uh, like a civil war. I now go to the Russian side of the story. This is Voice of Russia. It's a, it shows a picture of Lavrov, the foreign minister, uh, meeting with uh, the uh, secretary, uh, the NATO's general secretary, earlier in New York. That's some time ago. But the tensions here are between NATO and Moscow. So the report here in Moscow, this is what the Moscow News is reporting, is that Russian troops are, that the conflicting reports of the presence of Russian troops on the border of Ukraine are raising international tensions. There were reports earlier in the day from Kiev that Russian troops had entered Ukraine. You don't have any way of denying it or, or challenging it. You do know that uh, NATO has sent some forward, uh, some troops, some forward, uh, some aircraft into the Baltic countries. You do have reports that NATO has been conducting exercises in Romania and Bulgaria. All this, ad all this adds up to a chaos of news. It's like a, it's like a waterfall that it increases. There will be a new day and there'll be more of this. We don't know whether the Kiev forces, this is Ukrainian forces, are going to press their advantage in eastern Ukraine or if what we're witnessing here is the, uh, is the blow off of these tensions and everybody will pull back. There was said to be negotiation at the end of the day in Slavyansk, this one city where the forces were concentrating. This is not a big city. It's, I'm told that the, the moment here is about 120,000. I'm joined now by Professor Steve Cohen. Steve, I've been giving a breakdown of the day and how the chaos has proceeded with different reporting from Moscow and from London and from Washington and even photographs of the day of civilians watch, walking towards the Ukrainian forces with their rifles raised so that later on, uh, I wanted to illustrate the fact that there's no one version of what's going on in Ukraine. It's it's scattered everywhere. Good evening again to you, Steve. Hi, John. It's absolutely right. And not only is there no one version, but lots of tails are wagging the dog. Uh, you've got uh, provocations being caused by all sides. There are agents of many countries operating inside Ukraine, Russian, American, uh, Polish, Lithuanian, others. One thing we haven't discussed, and we might discuss briefly, is the nature of this government in Kiev. Because in this tug between East and West, the Kiev government is now acting under pressure, to be sure, from the West, but also under the pressure of its own domestic problems. Remember, this is a government that came to power through a coup inspired by street protest against uh, former President uh, Viktor Yanukovych of Ukraine. He was democratically elected. Russia has taken the position this government's illegitimate, that it has no right to act in the name of Ukraine. Right, they call them government. bandits, yes. Uh, well, let's leave aside the bandits. They just take the position it's illegitimate. And, of course, in terms of law, it is illegitimate. It has no legitimacy in international or Ukrainian or constitutional law. Uh, it's called elections, remember, for May 25, but only for the presidency. The Russians want parliamentary elections as well. The point, though, is, is can you really have any kind of election in Ukraine under these circumstances in just over a month? So I don't think we can count on the May 25 elections to bring any kind of unity or legitimacy to Ukraine. Now, we come to the decision by the acting, and he's acting President Turchinov, in the sense that the parliament, which is not a full parliament, because some of the deputies feeling their life threatened, ran away. <clears throat> and the parliament is under the influence of the street because the right-wing protesters are still there in the streets sent the troops today why it's interesting uh, we don't we're not sure uh, the there's there's now a kind of brewing rebellion in the streets of kiev against the government that the street put in power on the grounds that the government's not doing anything to resist the russians it issued the government did a couple of made a ultimato over the weekend but it never acted on it so finally it's sent and not very formidable-looking troops. It's fully possible that the pro-Russian Ukrainians who have taken the 10 or 11 cities in the east could defeat that so-called Ukrainian army by itself. I mean, the only fuel it has is provided by an oligarch. I mean, Ukraine is bankrupt. It has no budget. But the point here, it may be 
that the government in Kiev, lacking any legitimacy and dependent on the street for what legitimacy it has, is responding to right-wing pressure and therefore sent the troops. But there is an even more ominous possibility. This is not an accusation on my part, but it is, I think, something we need to watch out for. It's possible that this government in Kiev, being very unstable, representing at best, at most, half of Ukraine, the western half, at most, feeling itself nearly bankrupt, it, it, the government may have to uh, declare default within days, it's fully possible, that the only salvation it sees is for NATO to enter the country. Mm. And to get NATO to enter the country, you've got to provoke the Russians into entering the country. Now, is that what they're thinking? I am sure that some members of the government are thinking that, because it's a very diverse government. You remember we discussed this when we began back in November. It has some people who are neo-fascists, it has some people who are liberals, it has a mix of people. And you can remember the tape we have of uh, Secretary uh, of, of, of... Victoria Newland. Newland, yes. The, yes. the ranking State Department official in charge of these matters, trying to pick a government on the phone with the American ambassador. Uh, there's another puzzle here, John, which I don't understand, maybe you do. We now know that the head of the American CIA was in Kiev. John from, Brennan was from, confirmed uh, in Kiev over the weekend, now, yes. I mean, I am the fact that he was sent there... And why he was sent there, I have absolutely no idea. But allegedly, purportedly, officially, on a secret mission, and that whoever sent him, presumably the White House, thought that the mission would remain secret when everyone informed knows that the Ukrainian intelligence services are populated by many pro-Russian officers. That secret was out of the secrecy box the moment Brennan landed in Kiev. And it's an enormous embarrassment because it confirms the Russian narrative that the Kiev government is a puppet of the American government. It also confirms the Russian narrative, whether it's true or not, that this whole thing's a CIA operation. Why anybody would have sent him, even if it could have been a secret, I don't know. But is Washington so badly informed, and I think the answer is yes, so badly informed about the reality of the political and social situation in Ukraine that they thought that the head of the CIA could go there and be undetected. I mean, it is absolutely incredible to imagine that somebody in Washington thought this possible. Steve, when we come back, I'd like to... I'd like you don't to, know the answer I got. Yeah, yes, I do. I do know I that... Know. Yes, no, I'm told. Here's what I'm told. I'm told that John Brennan was sent there at the request uh, of the president to convey the president's best wishes to the Kiev government and to recommend that they enforce the law. That's what I'm told. And that, and this is not something Obama could have done by telephone or email or secret courier. He had to send Brennan personally there to do this. It certainly does look provocative, doesn't it? I agree with you. But I mean, imagine, John, they thought it could be kept a secret. That means they don't know what's going on inside Ukraine. I, was, hey, I mean, the White House. I was surprised that it was confirmed today. I'd heard it over the weekend, but it's one of those things that you shrug and you go, you can never get that confirmed. And then today it was confirmed. Well, they probably have pictures of him. I mean, you know, the Russians probably holding back the pictures or tapes. They've got tapes of everything else. By the way, one of the things we learn from all these tapes that appear is that the Ukrainian intelligence services are prepared to deliver these tapes to the Russians. I mean, that alone would have told you it wasn't a secure situation. Uh, Professor Steve Cohn of New York University, when we come back, Steve, I'd like to look for a solution here that doesn't involve gunfire. And this conference on April 17th, I'd like to ask your best outcome to watch, to watch for over these next days. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor, Steve Cohen of New York University and, Rus and Princeton University, Russian history professor here because on the 17th, we're told, the foreign minister of Russia, Lavrov, the secretary of state, John Kerry, and the Baroness Ashton, the EU foreign minister, and a representative of Kiev and possibly other cities in eastern Ukraine will meet to discuss, to negotiate a climb down. And Professor, I ask you, what is the best outcome for us to watch towards the end of the week? 
the best outcome is what we talked about at the beginning of this broadcast and what I wrote about in my Nation article, uh, Cold War Again, and that is a negotiation roughly along the lines of what Russia proposed a month ago. Uh, stripped down, and an editorial from me on each, an end of NATO expansion to former Soviet republics. NATO expansion eastward never should have begun. It's time for it to end. It's leading to war. Uh, that's a cardinal change of Western policy. I doubt that President Obama has it in him uh, to do it, but there are ways to do it informally and formalize it later. That would be a good outcome. Secondly, an agreement that there will be a new constitution in Ukraine that will be accepted by the East and the West, the conflicting regions, and that that constitution will be uh, a, a, a federal constitution akin to our own, but where the Kiev government has enough power that it will remain one state. And finally, that because Kiev is on the edge of the economic abyss, that wherever Kiev goes in terms of its main trading partners, that Ukraine and Russia remain the trading partners, because that economic relationship is essential to Russia, but it's just as essential to Ukraine. And, of course, that would mean no war. That would be the best outcome. Would there be a necessity for peacekeepers in Ukraine? These uh, apart, armored personnel carriers and the flyovers of high-performance aircraft are disturbing to anybody living in eastern Ukraine. Well, I think where that would come in, it depends on what they do about elections. Now, remember the disagreement about elections. The Russians are arguing that you can't have fair elections in May. It's too soon. Uh, the agreement that the European Union signed with Yanukovych, the deposed president, on February 1, called for elections in December. So the Russians are now saying elections should be in December. But there's another element. Uh, the Russians want not only presidential elections, but parliamentary elections. And the reason they want that is they don't think the parliament in Kiev today represents the country. Therefore, how could that parliament draft a fair new constitution? So the Russians want a parliamentary election as well. I think that's right. And the only obstacle to doing that is, is the current deputies of the Ukrainian parliament, the Rada, as it's called, in Kiev, don't want to subject themselves to re-elections. A lot of them may lose because the country's not happy with what's happened. But that would, I think you need elections for a new parliament, for a president, and a new constitution. And during that process... International monitors, I drifted from your question, but now I get back to it. I think the international monitors for those elections will, will, will be absolutely obligatory, and the Russians will agree to that. Everybody will agree to that. The question is, is whose international peacekeepers will they right, be right. if they go in earlier? Will it be United Nations? The Russians would probably accept that. They're not going to accept an EU, a European Union peacekeeping mission, because the European Union is a party to this warlike situation. The harsh words in Washington. By should... the way, the problem, the problem here is uh, Russians have served as peacekeepers under UN mandates in other countries and successfully, with one bad exception. When the war in Georgia, former Soviet Republic of Georgia, began in August 2008, which was a kind of prefiguring of what we're looking at in Ukraine, because NATO was headed to Georgia too, it began when the, when the Georgian government, mentored and trained by the United States, killed Russian peacekeepers on the boundary there, mandated by the UN. Russian citizens were killed. I'm not sure we want Russian peacekeepers in Ukraine, because if they get killed, as you pointed out earlier, it will be hard for Putin not to enter the country. Fifteen seconds, Steve. Harsh words in Washington. Yeah. Should we turn them off? Should we just not listen to them? I think we have to listen to them because it's, if, if they believe the word, they, the representatives of the White House and the Congress, if they believe what they're saying, it means they are almost totally uninformed about what's really going on in Ukraine. And people who are uninformed go to war.